Hello, hello. Um, welcome. Good day to you, uh, wherever you are. Um, uh, if you're watching us right now, or you're going to be watching us later. Uh, thank you for for coming. Uh, my name is Taiwa Falabi. I'm really excited to be having this conversation again today. Um, this is the second episode of Decolonizing Dramatology. Um, uh, theater makers uh, 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 in conversation from from Africa. Um, I'm so happy today, uh, and that's because we have three amazing uh, um, uh, guests, and I'm going to be introducing them uh, shortly. Um, but I'd like to first of all say um, I'm, I am um, dialing in today from Regina, uh, Saskatchewan, um, and I love to acknowledge um, where I am. I want to acknowledge those the past, the present, and the future. I like to also uh, mention that uh, wherever you may be uh, coming in from or you know dialing in from that would like to thank you for being here um, also special thanks to uh, howround um, and of course our um, partners uh, pan-african creative exchange safe world theater Mr. international and the university of regina uh, here in canada uh, for bringing, you know, bringing all of this together. I'm really excited about this conversation today. Um, thanks to Brendan. Brendan is there uh, behind the screen, uh, co-producing this with me. Uh, and of course, Sarika, our interpreter, and Adam, um, a captioner. Thank you so much. Today, um, which is the second episode, um, we're really considering dramaturgy and dramaturgical processes from Egypt, Nigeria and Zimbabwe. And that means that we have three amazing theater practitioners from these three countries, uh, which is great. Um, I'd like to introduce quickly um, um, Wale Ogmutokun. Wale Ogmutokun is a theater director, a theater a playwright, a dramaturg, a theater practitioner. And it, uh, it's really a privilege to have him with us. Um, uh, he's worked internationally, uh, and then I know he's going to speak more for himself, but I, it's just a privilege to, um, to have Wale with us. Uh, I call him Ogawale, so you permit me to continue calling him that. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, also, we, um, I'm, uh, Adam Afiz. Um, Adam is a theorist, an artist, a curator, um, and Adam writes on contemporary art history outside of Western paradigms on uh, uh, choreographic uh, systems, climate change, and post-colonial legacies. I also want to add that Adam is a PhD candidate at York University's Performance Studies Department. Um, Adam is going to speak more, uh, Adam is going to speak more for, for himself. Um, but I want to say something about Adam is that I'm really amazed by the kind of work that Adam does. Um, and the fact that we actually have uh, a representation also from that region. I, I did, uh, when we were talking earlier on, I did say that many times when we talk about the African region, um, th there is always that inclination to gravitate towards West Africa, you know, East Africa, South Africa, and, and many times there's always that voice that, that some of us are yearning to hear from North Africa. I'm not homogenizing North Africa, obviously, but I'm just saying that it's really beautiful to have a presence uh, on the series and on the episode, um, on the series from that region. Uh, finally, I want to uh, introduce Lloyd Onyigad Zino, a, a friend, a brother. Um, I've known him for, for over five years now. He's from Zimbabwe, he's a theater director, um, a playwright, uh, and an actor. And also uh, Lloyd is the founder and um, the principal of uh, uh, Zimbabwe Theatre Academy. He's also the curator of Mitambo International Festival, uh, and really exciting to to have the three of you uh, with us today. Um, thank you for taking this opportunity. Would would we drive? We're going to go straight into this conversation because I think earlier on, before we even started, we started talking about really critical issues that I'm hoping that we're still going to go back to them. For I'd like to start with Lloyd. Um, and I think my first question goes to all of you, obviously, is that how do you how do you conceive dramaturgy? What did what does that mean to you? And what's your journey into, into the land of dramaturgy? Lloyd, we'll start with you. Um, what, what does dramaturgy mean to you and what's your journey into that? How do you conceive it? How do you think about that in your own work? Um, over to you, Lloyd. Oh, 
Okay, well, uh, what we can also do is that in case it might be network there um, and log in and all of that. I just jump, uh, I just, I just go over to Adam, what, you know, but the question to you and then any time Lloyd is back, we just allow him to, to chime in. Go ahead, Adam. Thank you, Taiwo. Well, well um, my, I first got introduced to dramaturgy when I started working outside of uh, North Africa. I was in Europe and I was working with several uh, performance artists and theater makers and, and dramaturgy was the buzzword back end of 90s, early 2000s. Um, and I kept thinking, is this something that we do anyway back home and it just has a different name here? Or is this yet another new thing that we, we're, we're, we're going to have to learn about in order to be included in, um, in the art market um, with its dynamics and its politics? And for us, because the company that I work with, Haraka Platform, we create work that doesn't always necessarily depend on text. So very early on, we define dramaturgy for ourselves as um, basically it doesn't have to be a person doing it. So dramaturgy is the, the process of generating meaning and making sure that all the different aspects of the production are in conversation with one another, allowing this meaning that we're trying to work with to emerge. And then when we started working with a dramaturg as a, as a role and as, as, a, as someone fulfilling this function, it was very clear for us also from the beginning that it's someone who... Uh, his stakes are the actual work that's being made. So it's not asking the light designer or the costume maker or the video artist um, who do have other stakes um, in, the, in the production, but actually it's someone whose sole function is working with the quote-unquote dramaturgy. And throughout um, the past 17, 18 years of the productions that we've made, the person that fulfills this role has changed greatly from one person to multiple people. Um, yeah. To an extent, that the thank you so much, Tayo, for, for this opportunity. My fellow, uh, let's say, panelist, uh, Olen, uh, Adam. Uh, yeah, uh, I think. I think it's the network. He spoke a long time ago and it took a while to get to us. So, yes. Uh, Lloyd, uh, uh, Adam, uh, Adam is um, uh, about wrapping up. Let's, uh, let's allow him finish and then we pass it on back to you, all right? Okay, okay, okay. Go ahead, go ahead, Adam. Sorry about that. No, so just wrapping up that my interest later then was how different people can fulfill this role. So we worked with a psychoanalyst in that role. We've worked with a political scientist. We've worked with an architect and an urbanist. I can, I can talk more about this later, but I'm, I'm interested in how different kinds of people from different backgrounds can fulfill this role away from a theater tradition, away from the Gotthold Ephraim Lessing kind of story of origin of what dramaturgy and the, and the field of study has, has historically meant in a Western canon kind of sense. Interesting. We're gonna, and we're going to come back to that because your definition is the process of generating meaning and how other you know, folks in other disciplines can actually fulfill that role who do not necessarily identify or have the profession that we can call them, you know, theater artists. Is that what you, yeah? Yeah. Okay. We're going to, yeah, that's interesting. We're going to come back to that because um, that, I think that's, a, that's an interesting lens. Let's go back to Lloyd. Lloyd, um, if, if your internet permit, um, do you want to, sp you know, speak to the question? Um, what do you consider dramaturgy? Uh, how do you conceive it? Uh, and then what's your journey into dramaturgy? Lloyd, are you there? Yeah, thank you so much, Tayo. Uh, I hope yeah. you can hear me clearly now. Uh, yeah, yes, if you can hear me, I'm. can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you now, go ahead. Ah, okay, thank you so much. Uh, I would say for me, because I'm coming from a devised uh, background in terms of creating work, for me, it would be the, you know, the provocative, whoever's provoking the exploration in the creative process, you know, of analyzing and probably packaging a play into a dramatic or theatrical experience will be a, the drama will be dramatized to me. 
because we we use the body to investigate and to provoke whatever that needs to be. So other than probably other approaches where you have to submit a written two page, sit down, analyze it within the historical, political and social context. We are saying, can you place the body in space and <laughs> work as a dramatist? I know Wally was speaking about and who becomes the writer of the process. If you want to go in terms of who wrote this thing. So I was coming from a uh, devising, collaborative, you know, kind of community-based approach to writing and also the dramaturgical processes or process then becomes a collaborative Okay, um, I, I, I would try to kind of, I think what I'm hearing him say um, is that he's coming from a devised uh, background um, and so he works collaboratively. So for him, how he conceptualize or how, what he conceive as dramaturgy is whoever that has the prerogative of you know, provoking the creation and the structure and the processes of making that collaborative, create, um, collaborative creative process to all come together into a performance. Um, I, I hope I did justice to summarize that. I'll hand over to Ogawale now um, to, to hear his thoughts in, in terms of what, what, what does that mean? Um, both from a professional lens, because I know that he's a playwright and he's done a lot of that. Um, over to you. How do you conceive dramaturgy and what's your, what's your journey into, into, into that line? I, I think for the interpreter, Taiwo, it might be good to say Oga means boss. And I don't know why Taiwo is calling me boss. <laughs> but but um, uh, so um, Lloyd said some interesting things there. He said about it's about putting a, a work, putting a, a piece of theater in context, whether socially, politically, culturally. Uh, that would be the work of the dramaturg. Uh, if we use the textbook, definition it says dramaturgy is the study of dramatic composition and the representation of the many elements of drama on the stage for me it's calling a specialist it's calling a specialist to come adapt a piece of work for stage uh, that's how i see uh, that's how i see it now before this fancy term came before eggheads like taiwo and and co brought dramaturgy to us I had a practice. My entire cast often acted as dramaturgs. We would sit and we would put the play in context. We would read to understand it, to make it workable. You know, when we adapted Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart for the stage, the entire cast acted as dramaturgs for it. Well, I would be the lead dramaturg in that matter. But um, it's, it's how I see it, because there's no point in putting up a work if you have no real understanding of its roots, of the cultural inferences, of its cultural anchors, of its historical anchors. Uh, that's how I would say that. For me, that's my working definition. Interesting. Um, well, saying or guy, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's just me, just um, being... Be, Going back to my to my cultural inclinations here, um, interesting way of looking at it though, um, and and maybe that's gonna pose another question because then you're you're taking it away from the lens of an individual to that collaborative process that Lloyd is talking about. Yes. So how, what does that look like? Maybe in that example you cited. Could you give us an example of how that process went from a dramatur you know, that dramaturgical process? Uh, let, let's, let's take a play. Professor Wally, the Nobel laureate, Professor Wally Shoinka's 
um, madmen and specialists. It took an now. I, I had I was blessed with with a I was blessed with a highly intelligent cast at that point. We had a we were it was a, a repertory body. We had a we picked up work. We we made it ours and we delivered our own interpretation of those things. When we did that play, Mad Men and Specialists, we had to break it down to its true meaning. We had to break it down to its true meaning because for those who might have read it, it might be one of the most complex things ever written out of Africa. But because we had, but because we had able cast members, I would, I would, I would give my thoughts. I would give my thoughts on what, what the cultural or social context was. But it was a beautiful thing to have people who were, who had, we had cast members who would not enter into the role of actors until we had finished the dramaturgy. People like Sunko Miyadebayo, who was the best graduating student of his class in the University of Ibadan. Shola Roberts of the Lagos State University wrote to me, Fakunle, Lagos State University. They were actors, they were brilliant actors, but they were dramaturgs as well. And so we sat and we would break it down. We would come to an understanding, an explicit understanding of the work, and then we would make it happen. If you, if you, if you enter some things half-baked, not ready for the script, for the work. It never comes out right. Interesting. So I'd, say, I'd say that's our reflex with Renegade. That process that. of interpretation and making meaning making and that provocation happens together as a collective. I'm going yeah. to come back to that idea. I want to hear Adam's thoughts about, about that process for Adam, Adam who, who says that there have been other folks who are necessarily not actors but they've taken on that role. What does that mean? Adam, over to you. Well, I mean, as I said earlier, when when we started uh, using the term dramaturgy, I mean, maybe I'll start the, the, the story differently from another place. When I first tried to um, translate the term dramaturgy to Arabic and translate texts that deal with dramaturgy in Arabic, we had a problem because we don't have a term uh, such as dramaturgy that I, in Arabic, that I can use. Um, so we started, there was transliteration. So you just say dramaturgy and you write it in Arabic the way that you say computer and you write computer in Arabic. And I was thinking is maybe that's enough. You know, maybe sometimes you just take the word and do this, but then the, uh, we like in, in, in our company at Harka, we like getting into these problems. We like getting into a place where you cannot translate something and you cannot even easily explain it to the practitioners who are doing it, like explaining dramaturgy to people that have been making theater and have been choreographers for decades. And it's there that we started wondering, is this some um, foreign practice that truly is foreign? So it's like explaining classical ballet to someone that has never danced classical ballet. Or is this something that we've always been doing under different names? Uh, but this is just another way of formalizing it. But of course, the minute you start using the word dramaturg or dramaturgy, it invokes the history of the Western practice. It invokes uh, the fact that in Europe, theaters, a theater building, would have someone who is the dramaturg of that theater, of the national theater, of uh, whatever. The very first um, job given to someone as a dramaturg of a theater was in the 18th century given to Lessing, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, and that was in Hamburg. And he wrote this book called The Hamburg Dramaturgy, which is seen as a founding document in understanding what dramaturgy means. Um, and it, his position changed titles. So in the beginning, it was called uh, um, the dramatic judge, dramatischer uh, Richter in German. And then from dramatic judge, it became the dramaturg. Um, and I, if this was happening in the 18th century in, in an affluent European colonial power, what was happening in the 18th century uh, across the sea in Egypt? You know, because at the same time, it, we cannot assume that we all went through the same parallel um, genealogies and, and that we all share one art history because it's not true, it is false. What was happening is that many different other theater and performance practices that cannot be contained even in the word theater or in the word performance as in performance art have been happening and are still happening. And therefore, when I use that term 
dramaturgy or dramaturg, this is why I, I take it with a grain of salt, because I take it thinking of its very specific institutional Western history that was developing at such a um, moment of colonial uh, affluence. And I also take it while thinking of the many specific genres uh, and conventions that some of them don't even consider themselves to be art. Like when you think of a practice like Zar, which is a form of dance and theater, but it's also, it deals with exorcism and it deals with spirits. Uh, when you ask the practitioners who are some of the best musicians and theater performers you'll ever meet, they don't even consider themselves artists. They think this is a thing that serves a function, which is talking with the spirits. So they're not even, um, they don't see their practice in the, in the context of the art. So when you see people working with the aesthetic regime of power who do not define themselves as artists, of course, you have to ask yourself, what the hell does this term dramaturgy mean to these people? And if you're going to work with them, what, uh, what does it mean to engage in a dramaturgic uh, process? For our specific needs of, of dramaturgy, uh, I, I can give you anecdotes. So when we worked on a performance that was dealing with psychosis, and I did not want to create a performance about psychotic uh, disease, we wanted to really delve deeper and understand so the dramaturg was a psychiatrist. We worked at a hospital with a doctor and the doctor was walking us through what does this mean? We worked with patients uh, under the doctor's supervision and other nurses. And for us, this was a dramaturg. Another time we were working with how when urban planning happens very quickly in a city, how we move changes. You know, if a street is, is, is cut shorter and you have to turn around, you physically change your movement. So we hired an urban planner. And the urban planner was the dramaturg for this production. So this is what I mean by it's um, that for us, I focus more on the function uh, and how this person can, um, yeah, like contrary to the older way of understanding dramaturgy, it is about making a text adaptable to a certain moment in time or to a certain um, group of actors. Because we do not start from a text uh, in our creations, for us, this is why I'm talking about meaning and dramaturgy in this sense of someone that is serving a certain function. I'm not sure if I answered your question quite. Um, or... No, th thank you. I think you've sort of raised a lot of interesting ideas in terms of unsettling, unpacking the disruption around the term itself. So that we move beyond the nomenclature dramaturgy to really go deep and to start talking about really bigger issues. And I'm going to come to that. You know, one of the things you talk about, the question, one of the questions you did ask is, is this a term, Western term, or is it that this thing itself is something that we have been doing before this term was invented? And then these are bigger issues that we're going to we're going to come to those those things, uh, because the purpose for all of this is, you know, for me, it's are there are there other are there other issues or big ideas that we that this is giving us as a way into to actually have that conversation? Before we come to that, because that's going to be like like the, the the little you know the other half of our of our talk today, but before we go into that, I would like to ask the question for for the three of you in terms of you know uh, uh, for 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 you Adam in you know you've worked in 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 Egypt and now you were you were in the U.S. Uh, Lloyd is in Zimbabwe, Gawale is in is in has worked in Nigeria and some other places in the world. Um, what 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 what's the role of the place that you've worked at or you are currently working in? What role does he does he play in how that function of on in how you the fun, the role the, the function of dramaturgy you know comes to play? What role does that play? You know, place based you know practice of yours, the three of you, you know, what role does that play? In, in performing or in whoever that is a performing that role of interpreting, provoking, generating meaning and things like that. I'd like us to start with Lloyd, uh, if his uh, internet would permit. Um, we'd like to start with him and then we'll shift to, to Agawali and we'll, uh, we'll come back to Adam. Lloyd, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, uh, the place plays for me a significant role uh, as uh, Adam was speaking about uh, that, you know, in Arabic, they would not find the term dramaturgy, but then they're taking 
their bits and pieces of what they define dramaturgy as to then translate to the actors. So for, for, for me, dramaturgy or, you know, the place or where we are best, which I link to the culture of our people who are probably working with, then sets the foundation of understanding the context of the play or the words. Uh, so maybe in, 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 in Zimbabwe, if we say, let me give a name, Rudolf Slated to, to, to our local uh, people who know this. But again, you know, when you're working with, you know, what Karishma spoke about, the local pedagogy or the local understanding is that locally, are we sound and strong? to the thing that we want to speak about. So if it is in the, as we say, the political, social, economic realm, we, 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 the place then is setting us to have a strong foundation. So that even if we go to Nigeria, to Egypt, to the United States, that the dramatage does not serve only the aesthetics of the presentation, but then the inherent important meaning of what we want to convey, one not only to the public, but to ourselves, what we believe in. Because for me, it's not just about the aesthetics of the show that has been paid in. The actors that are coming are believing in the work that they are going to produce. Hence, they need to have been provoked in this exploration to understand but this is based on the, in the space that they were in. I did my training in the US, uh, in, in California. There's a small place up there in Northern California. It's Blue Lake. And you know the reason why they put the training is that it's so far away from urban settings because their pedagogy is, is, is strongly in, in putting people in nature and close to nature, hence, you know, uh, all our activities are connected back to nature. So I'm saying place like Harare being an urban city affects the way and the work that I'm going to produce. So I think place has a critical role. You know, if I was going to do a show that I'm doing called Zandes in America, it's going to have a different con you know, uh, 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 meanings if I originated there, even if I was a Zimbabwean. But now I'm local, I understand the Zimbabwean prison system or the people that have been prison and out of prison here, yeah. even if I were uh, I think we're losing, we've lost Lloyd again, but that's fine. I think he's sort of, I hope that we've been able to, you know, his perspective is the fact that, um, again, trying to summarize here, that the role that that plays, the locality plays in, that, in, in, the, in the entire piece around that um around you know function as, as a dramaturg within the context of production i'd like to come to uh to a guy Wale now to really speak to this question and and maybe also put in mind as you think about as you discussed dramaturgy in the context of production to also speak about the institutional understanding of dramaturg um because i know also for guy Wale and for adam also you you're not just talk, you've not just you're not just in the realm of production alone, but even in that institutional sense of audience, you know, education, con, you know, programming, curating festivals and things like that. Those are things that you've also done, the three of you, obviously. So over to you, um, Waga Wale, and then we'll pass it on to, to Adam. Thank you, Taiwo, for, um, for this particular question. Um, Firstly, first I have some background in law. I have some. I have. I have a master's degree in law, and I have been called to the bar. Um, but what I do is what I do is theatre. That is what I'm known for. That's what I practice. Now, I, I I want to say something. The reason I spoke about law is because, as an African lawyer, you have to learn law in Africa and also learn the law of the developed world. It is the same with literature. We learn our literature, and we learn the literature of the developed world. We learn our literature in English often, literature in English, then we do English literature. 
The 400 year old man, Shakespeare, is still relevant to us today because the makers study him. You want to go to Shakespeare's Globe? It's a Shakespeare play you take there. Now, some institutions have, they have living dramaturgs. They have dramaturgs who work for the theater. I don't know, uh, maybe some of these festivals, I don't know, Stratford here in Canada, the Stratford Festival, or maybe the Shaw Festival, they might have living dramaturgs, but we know people have this. But, but it is impossible for a Canadian dramaturg to practice his dramaturgy on an African play. I make bold to say that. I was dramaturg for Death and the King's Horseman here, put together by Soul Pepper and the Stratford Festival. And I knew there was no how a Canadian could have been a dramaturg in that play. It was so specific culturally it was so localized. One of the greatest plays ever written, in my opinion, Death and the King's Horseman. It was so localized that you needed to understand the culture to be able to profess on it. Same as another one I'm a part of here, my life in the bush of ghosts. If you do not come from a certain area, so, my boldness now is that the African, because he practices from both sides, can, can be a dramaturg for a westernized production, but he doesn't flip the other way. I cannot be a dramaturg on Arab culture. It's impossible. It's not my way. It's, I, I do not understand the cultural influ influences. I do not understand the anchors. I do not understand the little meanings that make up the whole. And that's so we, you know, when, when we say when we say the when we say the the institutionalized dramaturg or the dramaturg that comes with the institution, can there really be such a thing, even though others practice it? Can there be such a thing? Because if I speak about the Yoruba culture here, probably only Taiwo can can ask me questions about it, questions of meaning can say, maybe I think, because this is where I come from. This is what I was born in. This was what I was immersed in. So that's my view of, that's my view of the institutionalized dramaturg and the, the, uh, the dramaturg engaged for certain productions. There are some things that you cannot blanket dramaturgy on. So that is that is what I think about that. I do not know if there's still another part of this question I haven't touched on. I interesting. Um, you're well by Canadian. I, I just to put a caveat. I I think what you're referring to is you know you can I can be a Canadian and be a yeah. dramaturg to a Nigerian play. So you're, what you're referring to just to put a caveat is that what you're referring to by Canadian is that someone that is not cultured in that you know African sense of culture, right? It could be an Afri it could be an American, you know, it could be an, you know, that's what I mean. That's if right. not, yeah, if you're not immersed, if you're not immersed in that culture, it is impossible for you to profess to to profess dramaturgy on that work. Because you do not even have an understanding of even the names. Talk little the, the, the significance of the names, talk little of the songs, talk little of even the significance of meeting at a place where four paths meet. You have no idea about it. So things, all the connotations that are there are lost on you. Interesting. Yeah, uh, um, no, th th thank you for your thought. I'll, I'll pass it on to Adham. And, and, and Ad Adham, maybe in your also in, in speaking to this, uh, I, I wanted to also chip in, you know, uh, 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 Gawale kind of started us on that, you know, that institutional drama talk and, and the limitation of, of what that means within the context of, is it even possible at all and all that. I'd like to also speak to that, uh, apart from, you know, in contrast to that place-based that we're coming from, because the original question is place-based. Um, what does the, what does the role of that locality, the culture, the place that you're really playing that, in that whole functioning of a dramaturg? Uh, over to you, Adam. 
Well, I, I mean, I agree with everything Walla just said. And if I'm thinking of place um, and what that means, some people believe that the place matters and others believe that the place doesn't matter at all. So when I look at um, how my practice is dealt with, when when it's framed as Egyptian work or it's framed as Arab, which is something else, and then it's framed as African when there is an African festival and they want a North African uh, maker, or then as a Mediterranean, because Egypt is part of the Mediterranean world. And Egypt is also part of the Muslim world. So then there's that. You're a Muslim artisan and so on and so on. And every time this frame, this curatorial frame is put on the artist and the artwork, a place becomes the protagonist in the story that matters the most. That this is what they look for. They're looking for the Egyptian-ness in the work. And they're looking for the African-ness in the work and the Islamic dance in the dance you know um and this is interesting because it doesn't happen the other way around when there's a spanish choreographer or a swedish uh, theater maker coming to present in 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 our countries no one is expecting uh their um swedishness you know like no one is expecting i don't know and it's really I, i i will it sounds very banal when you say it the other way around but it sounds very typical. Like, I don't expect a Swedish person to talk about the forest and make meat balls on stage. But then we are expected to talk about the politics of food and hummus and farafel and the Palestinian issue and sand and deserts and camel. So our places are charged and the work by people like myself and like others on, on the panel today are seen as national and ethnic representatives to a formation of things that might have happened and things that actually maybe don't exist at all. So there's also the fact that sometimes you're asked to represent a fantasy that does not exist, or you are asked to represent a country that truly ceased to exist. It doesn't exist anymore. What people think you might represent today might be something they saw in the news 10 years ago. And in today's world, 10 years is a century. Things move very fast. So when I moved to New York seven years ago, or more now, I can't even remember how many years, but at least (laughs) say seven years ago, I I was at a conference without naming the conference. Um, And the expectation of me to to represent everybody in a country that has 100 million citizens was unbelievable. I don't understand how one person (laughs) with their practice could represent 100 million people. So that's one part of the problem. But then the other more important and more insidious part of the problem is that you have people that believe the space where they are does not matter to their practice and that their practice overrides any geopolitics. Mm -hmm. I find it very uh, alarming when there is one man as the dramaturg of a theater, say a theater in Berlin, major theater in Berlin, and there's one person as the dramaturg in this theater. This is the person that claims they have understanding of uh, of anything, basically, you know, of, of a company coming from Nigeria, a company coming from Algeria. And it's this person who might be Spanish or German or British or whatever, that they believe that they can have the dramaturgic um, insight. And then, then it makes me wonder, do we believe that there's such a thing as theater that is purified from any national and political and geographic uh, information at all it's just it's like saying chemistry or saying biology even science itself is rooted in politics and is rooted in political consensus there is no scientific or artistic consensus without a political consensus to start with but then i find it alarming because europe is creating an image of itself as a monolithic culture that one German dramaturg can work with the Spanish company, even that Spain itself, uh, between the Basque and the Catalan and, and, and Madrid is many countries. Um, but on our side, and this is not, we are better than you or you're better than us. It's just a, it's just a colonial history. Like Wally was saying, you study theater in Africa, you study your theater and you study theater of the other. When I grew up studying dance and theater in Egypt, I studied Shakespeare, but I also studied Syrian and Egyptian and Moroccan playwrights. And this, um, it's funny how the story gets written because then we're constantly the ones that need to learn. We're constantly the ones that need to look up to Western theaters to be updated and catch up with modernity and postmodernity as if it's a train that will pass us by and we have to run to catch up. 
while in fact the story is wrong because we know more about the history of both places and the practices of both places than a, a strictly Western practitioner does. But how stories get written um, is another conversation that we can keep for another question, maybe. Thank, thank you, Adam. Um, I, I'm happy both of you, you started us on an interesting course here because you're unpacking and unsettling that idea of institutional dramaturg. The limitations, um, the realities, the, the, the inherent fairness of that idea itself and the political realities that surrounds it. I think my question uh, to both of you, I know that Lloyd, we might have Lloyd at some point, um, and apologies for Lloyd is going back and forth just because of the internet, the realities of working you know, in, in, in this part of the world. Um, my question to both of you then is, what are those big ideas? And by saying big ideas now, I'm not necessarily looking in the context of size, but those ideas that the idea of decolonizing dramaturgy can help us to start talking and thinking about. You started, you started, you know, bringing them up one after the other. And I know we, we had an interesting, you know, session before we started, you know, a, a, you know, a, a live stream today. What are those ideas from your own work, from and and both of you, and of course with Alloyd, you've traveled internationally and you've worked internationally. What are those things, those subjects, those issues? that you think that the idea of decolonizing dramaturgy call us into to start rethinking what that means in the context of your work. Um, and, and, and we'll just allow you to, you know, to answer to that. Uh, and then we, we come, we'll come again after that. Maybe, maybe Yoga Wali, you can start us with that. Um, okay. Okay, so I, I, could, I could use a play. I could use Death and the King's Horseman as an example again. Um, so this play is a specific to a geographical area. It's specific to Oyo State, uh, to Oyo, the Oyo Kingdom in the area now known as Nigeria. It's, it has a king. The king, when he dies, is supposed to be buried with, with another high chieftain, the election. That play, that play, except you are immersed in that culture, or except the dramaturg has traveled there and has gone to learn, cannot be, it, 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 it cannot be, you can't do dramaturgy on it via Bluetooth. It's impossible. It can't be done long range. You have to be there. So, like Adam said, you have one man who thinks he's omnipotent and, and can, and can it, it's, 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 like, it's like being a dramaturge for a play that's written, let's imagine, let's imagine um, a play is written with Islam at its core. I can't work on it. I can't work on it because I do not have an understanding an in-depth learned understanding of that religion therefore i would make a mockery of it i would not that, that's my contention that's my contention but if i can do shakespeare it means i have the upper hand on you as an african dramaturg if i can do george bernard shaw because i was made to read him i have an upper hand i can fix both sides is what i'm saying it was, it's what I'm saying. Whose dramaturgy are we, de are we decolonizing? It is the dramaturgy, it is the view of the Western world that dramaturgy stems from it. In my opinion, it is the view of the developed world that, that it, is the, it is the source of dramaturgy for the rest of the universe. That's impossible. That's impossible. Because if you come into my culture, I will tell you, child, be silent. You have no understanding of what is going on here. It doesn't matter how many years of experience you have. You, I, I, read, I read something by Wilbur Smith a long time ago. And this one was dressed as a spy somewhere in the desert in Arab land. And when he urinated in the desert, 
he urinated facing the east and that's how they knew he was a, that's how they knew he wasn't real i will never have known that I, it's impossible how do you know that if you're not if you're not immersed in it you just so that sort of th things like that then if they're written in a in a in a in a piece of work are lost on are lost on the institutionalized dramaturg you know you're reading it's it's not you have you have to you have to now now i'm also going to say this the reason i do not profess the reason i do not profess to be an authority on african american work is because i have not walked in their shoes i do not understand the concept of a policeman pointing a gun at you it is alien to me when i'm in my country i'm king of my country policemen do not point guns at me therefore i cannot tell that story with empathy i might i might know it i might feel the horror of seeing a man kneel on another person's neck but i know it can never happen to me where i come from therefore if i try to tell that story if i tried to tell that story i would be telling an untruth that's me that's done thank you for that uh, over to adam um and then um, we're, we're going to go, I know that, and, and, and I just want to say thanks to our audience because we're engaging. There's, you know, uh, Brandon is getting us all the chats. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, we're going to engage with um, the last chat on, you know, dramaturgy and curation. We've come to that. But let's address this first, um, this question. And of course, the question, whose dramaturgy are we decolonizing? Uh, over to you, Adam. Um, I think I'm muted. No, I'm not muted. Um, I mean, it's not just dramaturgy, you know, when I was, I'll tell you another uh, funny story, funny and sad story. When I was doing um, my postgraduate studies in Amsterdam and I was studying choreography in a contemporary dance program. And then um, I was surprised that as someone coming from Egypt, everything that we're studying was European, maybe one or two North American mm -hmm. um references but everything else was European and no one uh, from the professors was uh, factoring in the fact that I am a man from Egypt who's making work that is specific to that place sitting there truly baffled uh, I didn't understand why the program is just called dance when it is specifically Western European dance why is why don't we give things their names why isn't it called Western European dance department it's just called dance but then when I do my dance, then it's marked. Then it is called Arab dance or North African or African or Middle Eastern and so on and so on. So why, why do I have to be treated with specificity? But then the work that was created by the Western and West is such a big word, but you know what I mean? My colleagues from uh, Serbia and from Spain and from the Netherlands, their work was just dance without any word that comes before it. It's not called Serbian or Spanish or Catalan dance. It's just dance. But my work has to be marked. So this was one of the first uh, things. And then I, I spoke with them and I said, I, I don't even if, know if I, if I start teaching in this university, what would I teach? I mean, I don't know why would I need to teach this? And then they said, well, we should introduce you to the director of the African dance program. And for, I mean, what is African dance? So they sent me to see this thing thinking because I'm from Egypt, I would understand about African dance automatically. And I don't even know until now what African dance means because what I see in an institution like this, it is a kind of dance that is a mishmash of different things that is presented primarily to um, to a Western context. And if you're in Africa, in any African country, and you say African dance, what this is meaningless. This doesn't mean anything, you know, because how many dances exist in every African nation to just take all these hundreds and hundreds of dance forms and put them all under one term and call it generally African dance, the way that we can say African theater and African dramaturgy. So I, I'm not sure, like, like Wally said, who are we decolonizing or what are we trying to decolonize here? I generally have been having a hard time with the word decolonize itself because it sounds to me almost as if something is over and finished 
an event that happened and it's long gone. And now we're just decontaminating. You know, it's a party that finished and we're just cleaning the house after the party. But I don't think the event is finished. I don't think colonialism is finished for us to decolonize uh, its impact. We are engaged in an active anti-colonial struggle. Colonization is ongoing in many ways and it just keeps transforming in a very treacherous way. But, uh, but it's practically ongoing, whether culturally or economically or in terms of, of the sweatshops that are owned and run in, in places and countries like mine and other countries in, in the Middle East or in Africa. And that's why I hesitate a lot when I use the term decolonize, because I don't like I think it's important to highlight that the act of colonizing and of sustaining colonial uh, empirical um, interests and, and, and um, uh, interventions, to use a, a nicer word than the words we should actually be using, is still ongoing. So. As I said earlier, we can think of the place because we are made to think of the place. And it's so easy for things to be confused. Like what I was saying, it's so easy to think that if you are an African man, then you can speak also on the African-American cause or the other way around. If you're an African-American writer, then you are speaking about blackness in general. But it's very different being uh, being african immigrant and being African-American. It's very different being Black in America and being Black in an African country. These things are not the same thing. and Or being white-skinned in an African country. You know, these things are... So this this nuance, maybe this is the dramaturgy that we need to think more of, this a dramaturgy of nuance or a dramaturgy of curiosity and humility, um, which, which I end up practicing and I really think it is an exciting and a generative place to be, a place of, of curiosity and a place of thinking also of specializations, like I was saying. For me, I'm less concerned with a dramaturg that comes and looks almost like this magic person that knows everything and dramaturgy is D, uh, it's apolitical, it's non-geographical, it's non-specific and it's almost like a car mechanic coming to just do things. I don't think there's such a dramaturg but for me, it's a very specific person, you know, that I need someone that understands better about neurology and psychoanalysis, then that's the dramaturg for this project. Or I need an urban planner or an architect, then that's the dramaturg for, for this for this point. I appreciate the nuance that, you know, you both are really bringing into these now and the complexity and unpacking of whether decolonizing itself um, and dramaturgy itself. Um, I'll come to Lloyd. I want to know that I know that our, the fifth episode is around dramaturgy as a curator and programmer. We have a comment here uh, on, you know, again, going back to institutional dramaturgy and the fact that uh, the principle of shared leadership comes to mind. And, and I'll read all of that at that point. But <clears throat> without really giving much, going much into dramaturgy, uh, dramaturg as a curator and programmer, and, and this is for Lloyd. Um, um, I, I, I wanted to ask you, Lloyd, in terms of your work at Mitambo Festival, um, how does that look? I mean, what, what the impact of your, your, the, your, what's your curatorial approach to that within the context of dramaturgy? Um, that even if you think about it from, from that standpoint anyways, but is there anything you want to share? Because I know that Mitambo International Festival in Zimbabwe has been ongoing for two years now, and you are the curator of that, Lloyd. And, and also, we've been part of other festivals and seasons and all of that. Do you want to speak to that, Lloyd, in terms of you, you know, being a curator and a programmer uh, for a festival? Yeah, um, thank you for that. Sorry, guys, for breaking up. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this year is the third year we did it, and it was quite interesting because we had eight African guests from eight different African countries. And then one of the uh, participants said, you know what? I loved so much the place this time. And I said, why did you love the place? They're like, because they were not Western. They spoke about probably <laughs> things that I could relate to as an African. But, you know, we've got an international within the Mitambo International Theater Festival. So I think it was only this year we were enlightened about the importance and significance and power of coming back to the basics of knowing who we are and, and, and speaking what we know and not probably just work based on uh, imagination. So in terms of curating over the years, we wanted to mix, you know, in terms of aesthetics, 
and also stories from all over the world how they you know meet in a in a in a, in a pot and then people share their different perspective and you know we're bringing everyone from asia europe america to be you know to be part of and part of this so i think it has not really been uh, one of our priorities to say we really want to 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 speak to to this but i think after this year's uh, comments <laughs> i'm thinking we should have a, a segment an african segment which is specifically dedicated to our work also if we want to speak about you know decolonizing i know wale i, I just said last pass was saying uh, and also adam uh, what are we decolonizing ourselves from and who is it but for for me looking at as an example of the academy is decolonizing from the western structures and you know uh, that you know uh, some of our students who go into universities are taught that this is the structure of, of a play this is a well written play uh, this is how you should speak uh, you know you you cannot speak uh, your own language in a play because the international audience might not uh, you know understand so I, I think decolonizing ourselves from these approaches and structures and also thinking that, you know, you can't tour with a play that is half your local language, understanding, you know, Wally spoke about, you know, the various things. And I, 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 I remember thinking that, you know, in terms of gestures, uh, there are certain gestures that are peculiar to Zimbabwe that are so important that if I put it in a play, not only the people playing there are so comfortable, in achieving the vision of the play or whatever that it is we are trying to portray in this performance. But they are so important that we need to, to keep them and to preserve them wherever we go. So I know I mix a lot of things because I've been breaking enough, but in terms of curating in the festival, uh, we are curating it, so we are in charge. So whenever we feel this is the right moment to drive, probably let me seem political, the African agenda, then we are going for it. Because that's what we're feeling at that point in time, but we're not mandated to only do Africa, but because it's an international festival. So hence we need different international dramaturgies, if they are, who come with their point of view to this particular festival. Uh, th thank you. Um, thank you, Lloyd. I'll just read some comments here and uh, we will, uh, and hopefully again, the three of you are listening, um, what ideas come out for you, just respond to them. Uh, um, so the first comment, um, and some of the comments we've addressed them, uh, some questions, some are yet to. Uh, um, great conversation. I feel this concept and these ideas also relate to curators, basically any gatekeeper. The principle of shared leadership comes to mind. More and more platforms, venues, and festivals are looking at more guest curators to break down this single point of view. Perhaps this is also something to think about with regards to institutional dramaturgs and uh, Lloyd and uh, sorry Adam and Wally and, and Lloyd if any of you if you have any thoughts uh, to any of the comments just let me know I'm just going to read them please just let me know and you can chime in uh, let me know um, the, the second comment uh, very true Adam um, just think about the colonization happening right now online so many digital platforms are heavily colonized who uh, the colonizers in you know inverted comma um, comment, thank you for this conversation. It is so deep. Um, another comment, dramaturgy of nuance is a great term. Um, can we extend to con contextualizing, con contextualization in presentation and how is this important thing in um, TED Ativ or performance exchange? I don't know what that is, but what I said earlier on is that, you know, that, that dramaturgy of nuance, like, and that's what, you know, the three of you are really saying, is that it's not, we need to stop boxing ourselves into this idea of this is what it is and knowing that, you know, it's not just one straight jacket and really understanding the complexities and the, the, of some of these things. So, um, um, oh, okay, so can the three of you, the question is dramaturgy of nuance is a great term. Can we extend to contextualization in presentation? Um, and how is this important? How is this an important thing uh, in all African exchange? Um, maybe both of you can. Maybe the three of you can speak to that. Um, can we? Can, can we I extend? Say, to can I say something? Yes, please. So someone put a comment up there. Yeah. And said, "How can there be?" I'm going to read it now. It just came up. Yes. How can we think of decolonizing art when the largest African political institution? has not one African official language. 
I'm talking about the African Union. Yeah. Now, now, <laughs> so there, there are three of us here now. There's Adam, who's from North Africa. There's Lloyd, who's from the South. And there's Wale, who's from the West of Africa. We do not share languages. The language we share is a colonial language. And someone actually thinks that us not having one language at the Africa, I hope, I hope it's a metaphorical language that is referred to. Someone actually thinks that not having one language makes us less legitimate. This is our uniqueness. This is our beauty. This is how we are massive. This is how we, we are who we are. The fact that we are different is the magic of Africa. Nigeria has 250 languages. 250. That is the magic of Africa. Why do we need one language? If they interpret Spanish and whatever to people, interpret Africa as well. The truths, the truths, what's that thing in the American constitution? These truths are universal. The that truth, is. the truths are universal. They're the same across the world. They're the same across the world. In humanity, a man kneeling on another man's neck is the same all over the world. It is murder. A man saying countries in Africa are shit all countries is the same all over the world. It's bigotry. It is racism. It doesn't matter what language is being spoken. When I see Mo Salah in football, it is one language. It is Africa. So we do not need one language. The, the, the difference in our tongues is not a difference in our humanity. It is not. And so when I saw that, I thought, why does the African Union need? Have you not seen the dressing of those people? Have you not seen the? I was thinking of something. I bought a second TV because my son troubles me. So I got a smaller TV for him to watch. And by some chance, Al Jazeera came with it. And I could not believe the difference between the news being told by Al Jazeera and CNN. We're talking about colonization. That is colonization. What CNN tells us is colonization. There is, there is, the rest of the world is legitimate. Africa should have a place. We don't have to, we shouldn't have to defend ourselves. I will quote from Death and the King's Horseman. Child, I am not here to help you understand it. Africa does not have to explain itself. You take the languages, you take us as we are. You take the Ghanaian, you take the Zimbabwean, you take the Egyptian, you take the Nigerian. As we are. And this is what we say about decolonization. The fact that you do not understand something does not mean you have to be afraid of it. This is who we are as a people. And this is what we fight about every day. So Adam says that, the fight isn't over. This is what we have to face every day, all the time, hidden in nuances, but it's there all the time. The person who says African theater is fused, therefore it cannot be real theater. Who made you the Lord and judge over us? Who made you? We are the ones who feel the rhythm. Who made you? Okay. Uh, this is, <laughs> uh, I, 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 can, I can see you. We really reacting passionately to to this conversation uh, to this comment because whether we you know I know that there is another comment that I do not mean this I mean not every not one language only colonial languages and all of that um, but I think it's also important you know the, the place of language culture and the whole idea of homogenizing I think it's really critical too is that understanding that nuances should be allowed at every point in time in human existence. And, and I think that the more that we think that people's culture is less than the other, or the more we think that their language does not because they don't speak the general language and then intellectually they are, they are not up to standard and, and things like that. Um, 
I think that these all these ideas coming together are, are big ideas that I think that this is giving us way into this conversation. Over to you, Adam. Um, do you want to maybe not the maybe the language, maybe not maybe the dramaturgy of nuance as you know, and really contextualizing that in presentation. Any thoughts to this comment? And of course, we we'll come to Lloyd. Over to you. Um, well, one of the comments was talking about colonization online, and I just will quickly jump to that because I. I work a lot with different technological tools as ways of practicing dramaturgy. One of the performances we were doing, we wanted to examine texts uh, from the American court in relation to Arab and Muslim immigrants to America from the late 19th century until the mid of the 20th century. So that's a lot of texts. How can you explore all these texts um, in a way that truly pulls out certain moments in history and politics of the words and certain terms that are used. So what we did is that we decided to take all these texts and put them in um, data analysis programs and use language parsing tools to figure out what was the most common word that was said and what was the most um, um, pairing of words, like when you say this word, what comes after it, and from there we start with the matrigy. And so we started the performance thinking we are creating a work about Muslim immigrants coming to America and how, just a brief history, from the 19th century until 1940s, it was illegal to be both Muslim or American and Arab and American. You could not. You could you can immigrate, but you cannot acquire the American nationality because the law does not allow Americans to have the Muslim faith and does not allow Arab uh, and North Africans to be Americans, point. So this is why we started the project. Now, long story short is when we started using this technology, something funny happened was that the word that was most commonly used was the term white person. And the, the least uh, common word that was used was Muslim. So Muslim appeared only eight times in 60 or 70 years of history. And the term that was there all the time was white person. So by utilizing this technology, our dramaturgy became upside down and we realized we're actually making a performance about the creation of a category such as white man and the white person and what it goes to create and sustain whiteness as an important part of the American identity. And so it, in, in a way, while technology is always used against us and when, when coding is made, it does not imagine an African face or an Asian or an Arab face it imagines a white male face when you're talking about face recognition and so on. And so, some way I'm like, I'm happy face, face recognition does not think of people like us when it's being designed. Um, but it's there's also ways of using technology to flip it on itself and use it to discuss the hegemony of a certain race or the hegemony of a certain uh, regime of power. At the same time, something really interesting that's happening now is how a lot of people are turning to the blockchain as an alternative technological solution in order to create and organize decentralized communities online that are truly decentralized, as in there is no one company that owns the data. Things happen between all these supercomputers spread around the world. Uh, it's denationalized, so it doesn't belong to a country or another. And there is already um, African artists that are creating a blockchain-based platform that is just for African and Black artists. Um, I'm working as the creative director of a platform called Wizara, which is specifically looking at uh, the meeting between Arab, Asian and African artists. So we're really interested in this um, shift of perspectives and how we bring people into conversation. So there, there are uh, initiatives here and there where people are trying to look specifically at the colonial uh, power that technology has historically had. And it's, of course, colonial and capitalist because they're both related to one another today. And from there, trying to create something else. So I would, yeah, I think there's interesting things that could happen. Uh, th thanks, Adam. Um, I also want to say that thinking about, you know, nuance, I think we need to really, I really want to, you know, you know, I don't want to overcome it myself here. I think really bringing in that dramaturgy of nuance is really something that, that's really interesting because even when we talk about digital platforms and technology, we also need to change to understand that the idea, it's, this thing itself, it's not just a white person sitting down to do it alone now. We have best brains in the world who are necessarily not, you know, you know white. They're, they're, they're of different nationality. And, and all of this that we have today is not just one single person, 
it's a it's a brain work of different people regardless of their nationality also so i think those are also those are also ways to really start rethinking this all of these ideas that it's not it's not just you know one one white person sitting down to just create all this it's a com it's a constellation of ideas from b different brains all over the world regardless of where they're coming from uh, let's let's not go into this rabbit hole. Let's come back to this also and say uh, two comments here. Uh, 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 I guess this idea of nuanced dramaturgy, as well as dramaturgy of place, becomes particularly interesting to further explore when we look at international exchange or presenting work internationally. Since then, two cultures come together, either from different artists collaborating or artists from one culture and audience from another. Here's the question, I think. Do you feel there, there, do you feel there two dramaturgs from both cultures should come together as well to collaborate? What is your experience in this with regards to dramaturgy? Uh, and any of you, the three of you can pick that up. Uh, I know that Wally, you talked about your work here in Canada with um, Shaw Festival and, and other festivals. Adam also, and of course, Lloyd uh, in Zimbabwe. What, what do we think about collaborative dramaturgy? you know, dramaturgs coming together to collaborate from different cultures. Have you had experience like that before? And what does that mean? What's the dramaturgical process in that entire arrangement? Yeah, maybe I'll just sh share a bit uh, that I think the word that has been used is quite good, collaborate. So I think within the, the context of decolonizing, like, uh, sorry to just put you back again, you know, there was Ruth Fingard who said there was never theater in Africa. You know, it starts from there. So the idea of collaborating, who, who is initiating the collaboration? That's where my, my point is. It are uh, you, Tayo, in Canada telling us, Lloyd, there's guy coming for you to work with, or it's us initiating that there is this thing that we have developed and we are working towards. So there's an idea of imposing and collaborating, which there is a very thin line there because you might say it's collaborating and then there's the superior being or force that is coming to then oversee or mentor or give advice because it has been done. So for, for me, it, it can be done, I think, it's, but it's also contextual in the different context to say, where is it starting from? How much time is it we put? You know, you can't do that in like a month or two week, two weeks, like collaborating on what? That That's a lie. That's just putting names to a particular project for us to, to give it relevance. So as, as, as Brother Wally was saying long ago, that it's, it's, it doesn't start just from the paper, but it's a lived experience that I'm sharing in this encounter. So it cannot be just said within two minutes of us meeting together. It should have been like way, way before. So I just thought of, of popping in there in terms of collaboration, yeah. Thank you. Oga Wale, do you want to speak to that in terms of maybe from your experience working across these regions? Yes, please. Yes, please. I am curious as to how two people can be dramaturgs on one project. Like Lloyd just said, one has to step down for the other. So one is actually, they might be saying collaborating, but there will be a voice that is that drowns the other out. How do two people, so okay, maybe so some institution already has its own in-house thing and they say, let's bring in a specialist. Someone has to back away, you know? Someone has, one of my most horrendous experiences was trying to write a play with a French writer, a writer from France who would use Google Translate, you know? We spoke different languages and even though they use the term generously writer, it was, it was, it leaves a, it leaves, I feel nauseated sometimes when I think about how stressed I was with it, you know? So I do not think two dramaturgs can work on one project. Like Lloyd said, whose project is it? Whose project? Who's, who's the one who's the lead dramaturg there? Who's the one who understands the nuances? The one who actually is the dramaturg? It's um we like we like we like um we like titles on paper, you know, and saying, you know, this is a collaborative work. And like the gatekeepers like that kind of thing as well. So they tell us gatekeepers being let me offend Taiwan a bit here, British Council, Gote, the French Cultural Center. You're not offending me. I'm just saying I'll call their names. Gatekeepers, people who say you are the ones who can get through. 
this funnel, this this bottleneck, yeah, the ones we are permitting. So they say this is the system we want now. We want a combination, a collaboration. If a play is coming from Britain to Nigeria, and they say they want me on the team, it says either I'm leading the team or I'm not leading the team. You understand? Let us not pretend a collaboration in, dramato in dramaturgy. You know, it's either I'm there or I'm helping out. I understand there's nothing the matter with helping out, but don't that collaboration thing. People, people, people make awkward marriages. That's me. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Gawali. Adam, what's your thought? Well, first, I just wanted to pull out an old comment from the messages to clarify a little misunderstanding. The person that was speaking about the African Union languages uh, clarified and wrote saying he doesn't mean or she or they don't mean um, one language only for the entire African Union, but they meant to say that the African Union only uses the colonial languages and does not use any of the languages of uh, Africa. And uh, the, the African Union claims that it's uh, um, using English, French, uh, Portuguese, but also Kiswahili and Arabic. But actually, when you do go on their website, the Kiswahili and the Arabic functions do not work. So you, you end up reading everything in English and French. So in a way, yes, while they do announce that they are using other non-Western uh, languages and here only Arabic and Kiswahili out of the thousands of languages uh, possible, um, you end up only getting um, the text either in English or in French. Maybe sometimes it's in Portuguese when the meetings have to do with a certain locality in Africa. So that's just to, to because I, I understand Wally's passion and I fully um, support it, but the person just wrote a correction for us to understand what they meant. Um, as Thank for, you for can you? Thank you for that, Adam. Thank you. Sure. And as I as for, can you have two or one several people doing the message? It really depends on what you're doing. As I said, I don't think. Like, I don't think of making theater or making performances as this monolithic experience that can be reproduced exactly the same every time you do it. Um, and therefore, yes, I've had moments where there was more than one dramaturg involved in the process, um, each fulfilling a certain function. And again, like you can think of the dramaturg, if you want to think dramaturgy is this abstract, apolitical a uh, thing that happens like electricity, you know, then the dramaturg is just the mechanic that comes and fixes things in a car. And if you think of it as something more specific to what you're doing and therefore specific to a given moment in time and a space and culture, then of course they have to also have the nuance and the understanding of these specificities. But then you can also, as I said, think of the fields of knowledge you want to invoke with your practice that maybe you don't have access to and that's why you need a specialist. Um, and then it's really, um, it's, um, it's about scientific knowledge sometimes and it's about a certain philosophical or political knowledge or understanding sometimes and I don't like I can't say yes or no but I personally have worked with in one production with more than one uh, dramaturg working collectively towards something um yeah because I don't it, it, it's not black and white that yes or no well, there have thank been you. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I think also perhaps we're talking, we're coming at this conversation at different, some of us are coming at it from a geopolitical perspective, um, geopolitics rather perspective. Some are coming from that international collaboration, um, also from an institutional standpoint. So I think that we, I think of what I'm putting on the table today is really that idea of nuance dramaturgy, or dramaturgy of the nuance, that it's all, it boils down to really understanding the context where we're coming from and how all of that really plays out within the political, within the aesthetics, within, within the humane components of that, right? Um, I know that we have just seven more minutes to bring in, bringing this to an end. Um, I'd love to give the three of you to ask yourself questions. Uh, and if there are still questions from our viewers, uh, please uh, put that in. Uh, it will get to us, thanks to Brandon that is doing that for us. So, uh, you know, Adam, do you have any question you want to ask? Or Gawali, or Gawali, do you have any question you want to ask? Adam and to Lloyd, I'll allow the three of you to, to do that. If, if you have any question or any thoughts um, as, we, as we start to bring this to, to, to an end. I'd like to say that um, the, that thing about the African Union, my response was not directed at the writer of that thing. It was, it was a general response. 
I, I, you know, I said, I asked, I said, I hope it is a metaphor, metaphorical language I was referred to, you know, but it is uh, the, the idea, the very idea of us, of course, we shouldn't be, I mean, English and French, we know what they've done with it. I get very passionate about this. <laughs> I get worked up. Um, any question for uh, Lloyd? Do you have any question for, for Adam? Or Adam, any question for Lloyd and, and to Gawali? Any question? Uh, it's, for me, it's not a question, but I think uh, just an, uh, a, 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 a great, uh, you know, unpicking of, you know, the two ways decolonizing dramatage or, uh, you know, starting from where, you know, if we, if we go down again, we are decolonizing from from the gatekeepers before we even go. So for me, it's quite interesting how also Adam and Ole were trying to unpack this. That it's not just a it's not just a small ball that we can start bouncing and and pulling back. And then these are quite several balls that are in this sack that we're shaking and trying to rearrange. But we know they are there. But I think it's, it depends on how you want to <laughs> address it and articulate it or decolonize it. Yeah, so it's just a, it's just a, a point I wanted to put out there. I have a question for Adam. So my question is, in, in, the, in the collaborations, Adam, how, well, you know, how did you, was there a lead dramaturg? Was there someone who was a lead dramaturg or was it, you know, or were there different departments in which each dramaturg was a lead for specific areas. I'm curious as to how it worked, having, you know, different ideas come together. Well, it, it's, it was a very long process. And in general, most of the work that we do takes a very long while, to, like it takes two years to make one piece average time. And it partly because we like to spend time really thinking and researching and digging and partly because it takes a lot of time to raise the kind of money that is needed to put a production today, especially when you're working with people living in different countries and in different um, migrational um, routes. Uh, but the time is, a, is one thing, like I think spending time together allows things to settle and um, and work. And another thing, I think difference is that these people truly come from very different perspectives. <laughs> and in that sense, each of them knew what to say and what to do that is specific to their knowledge and the others did not have that knowledge. So they were curious and they would listen. And I don't know, I think because we've done uh, work that, that requires us all to collaborate and, and, and have a shared um, authorship in a way, we, we sort of accept it in the process. We've had difficulties with people that have not worked with us come in into the group. So we've been working together for around 17 or 18 years now. And when we invite someone that has not been part of the group from outside to come and fulfill a certain function, sometimes it immediately works. They plug in and everything is beautiful. And sometimes they come in and they're totally destabilized with this very collective uh, authorship and once it's a funny story but it's, it's actually true once they said so how do you write the credits when you're writing in the program notes do you just say everything by everybody <laughs> or, or their function and we said you know what it would be lovely to actually say everything by everybody because a lot of our work is really created this way but then there comes moments and again it's very technical that the person that is really a musician is the one that finishes the sound score and she's the one that signs that sound score the person that knows how to create film is the one that creates our media score. And then it's that person that signs the, the, the media score. So the signature of authorship that happens at the end comes from a technical uh, knowledge and a technical and a practice-based uh, perspective rather than an ownership in the sense of this is my intellectual property. And I don't know, I really think it's about spending time, a lot of time. Th th thank you, Adam, for that, for giving us more context, because then that sort of also help us to understand where you're coming at from. Um, well, th thank you for that, because then thinking about, you know, collaborate, collaboration within the context of what you're talking about, if you're working with someone for 17 years, obviously, I feel that that kind of collective, you know, uh, journey, you know, can automatically come together versus just having somebody to come on. Um, and then in two weeks, you have you have to produce something versus you have two, three years to, be, to get it done. 
I'm very mindful of our time here. Uh, we only have one minute and want to really stick to ensure that um, we were on time. Uh, just just in few you know few seconds, any last thoughts uh, from from Ogawa Lee to Adam to Lloyd? Any last thoughts? Uh, and then so that will bring it to an end. Any last thoughts about what we've talked about today, your dramaturgical process or, or decolonizing or language, or I think we, we kind of spoke about so many things today. Any last thoughts? Uh, we'll be happy to can chime in quickly. Lloyd, do you want to go? Any last thoughts? Yeah, let's continue decolonizing dramatization however way we, <laughs> we defeat and interpret. Uh, thanks, Lloyd. Um, Ogawale. Oh, no, I'm good. I've enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Adam? Well, I wish we could all meet uh, in person, and I wish that we could all meet within one or the other African country of the countries that we work with and, and come from. Yeah. Well, we have, well, we have strong folks um, in this series, so maybe we might reach out to each, uh, I might reach out to all of you and say, hey, do we have anything to plan together and all meet? Because it would be nice to to connect together. And I want to say thank you to the, to, to, to the three of you. Thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation with you. And I think for me, one thing I'm going back with is that, you know, that idea of nuance, dramaturgy, dramaturgy of the nuance and what that means as we think about decolonization, as we think about working across different geographies, specific geographies and locations and cultures and, and different things like that. I want to say thank you to all our partners, Pan-African Creative Exchange, around uh, uh, Safe World, um, Theatre Mission International, the University of Regina. And thank you to, uh, to Sarika, to Jay, uh, and to Brendan over there, and to Thea, and of course to Alexa, uh, and to everyone. Uh, hopefully you can also join us uh, next week, Wednesday, for the third edition, uh, for the third, third episode. From me here, I want to say thank you, and um, thank you so much for connecting and for being part of this today. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tyrell.